Uh, well, I have the honor tonight of introducing today's speaker, and I think um, all of you being here, you're going to get a lot out of this. And so I want to see people with pens out, phones out, taking notes, um, because when you have these intellectual opportunities on campus, this is about you growing not just as students, but also growing as, as people. And so we know that a lot of the education that takes place happens outside of the classroom. And so this is going to be an opportunity for you um, to get some gems. And so hopefully you are ready. And so I have the honor of introducing um, Dr. Gordon. Um, he is an Afro-Jewish philosopher and musician, born in Jamaica and grew up in the Bronx, New York. Anyone from the Bronx in here? He earned his PhD in MPhil in philosophy from Yale University. In addition, he earned his BA, Magna Cum Laude, Phi Beta Kappa, in philosophy and political science as a member of the Lehman Scholars Program at Lehman College and City University of New York. Dr. Gordon specializes in Africana philosophy, phenomenology, social and political philosophy, aesthetics and philosophy in film, literature, and music, philosophy of existence, philosophy of science, philosophy of education, and philosophy of culture. A philosopher and music musician, he is the honorary president of the Global Center for Advanced Studies and honorary professor in the unit for the humanities at Rhodes University in South Africa. In addition, he serves as chair of global collaborations for the Caribbean Philosophical Association. As a musician, Gordon performs music in blues, jazz, and alternative rock bands and speaks as a public intellectual across the globe. And when looking at his CV, I almost broke the scroll button on my mouse as I was trying to get down to the bottom. You're truly an impressive scholar, sir. His scholarly work is amazing. He is the author or editor of 16 books and two more in press, including Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism, Existentia Africana, Understanding Africana Existential Thought, an Introduction to Africana Philosophy, What Fanon Said, A Philosophical Introduction to His Life and Thought, and Geopolitics and Decolonization Perspectives from the Global South. He has also published more than 85 journal articles and 70 book chapters. So in tonight's talk, Dr. Gordon will examine the philosophical implications of black music, the context of its birth, and some ways in which it, its origins often lead to misunderstandings of its continued value. According to Gordon, born from the misery of enslavement, black music is at its core an assertion of freedom in countries that refuse to admit the humanity and value of black people. The discussion will involve exploring in philosophical terms some of the dynamics of spirituals, blues, jazz, rhythm and blues, rock, reggae, and one of my favorites, hip hop. So please join me in giving a warm Quinnipiac University welcome to Dr. Lewis Ford. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, making sure that everybody could hear me. Um, in a way, you've already uh, honored me when I saw that line coming out there. It's unfortunate that fire codes are jeopardized but we have the, um, the benefits of technology. I'm going to speak uh, with uh, enough time that I could hear from you. Although you're here to hear from me, I take certain positions which I'll explain that will um, give a sense of why it's important for me to hear from you, okay? And the first one I should tell you, some of you have people in, these ro in the room called professors. And many of you in the room have the identity of students. But I gotta let you in on a secret. What a professor really is, is an advanced student. A professor is someone who fell in love with learning and just continued to learn. And so as you join this world of learning, it's you bring to it things that are different from a lot of us who are professors, which means the other secret, which is now open, what every professor knows is that all we're here, although we're here to teach you, we're also always learning from you. So, I begin first, I never speak with my shoes on. And so some of you have seen me on various, oh good, no hole in my socks. And many of you have seen me in other contexts, and so right away, I have to explain that the, the, the reason I don't speak with my shoes on, there are many reasons. And don't get caught up into the mentality that when you give reasons, there must only be one. Reasons are not like this television series Highlander, you know, it can only 
be one. Now, it shows my age because you all are so young, you don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, one reason is that when one speaks, one is expected to speak truth. And truth connects to those who preceded us, the ancestors. And as ancestors, they have descendants who are we in this room. And if we take seriously the relationship of ancestors to descendants, then the descendants are also people who are not in this room. And if you make yourself really accountable to truth, then it should be able to speak across the ages. And as a consequence, the accountability, the evidentiality is right there in this notion of ancestors and descendants. Now, of course, it gives you an idea that our planet is in trouble because there are some people who don't understand that. They have no regard for the ancestors and they don't care about descendants because their narcissism makes them think that when they die, that is the end of the world, which makes some of the issues like what happened last Friday very crucial because how do we explain the idea right, that we have put in the hands of, of, of not only our lives, but a lot of other lives on the planet, people who have no regard for accountability to those to come. So it's an act of respect also when I take off my shoes because another metaphor of truth is that truth is naked and I'm not gonna get naked. <laughs> but I can at least symbol it, symbolically be naked by taking my shoes off, have my feet on the ground as a connection to the ancestors and the descendants. And of course, there's nothing wrong with another reason. It's comfortable. So that is where we begin. Now, I'm going to be, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about music. I'm going to talk about what, what do we even mean when we say black? And then I'm going to, to connect them briefly. And that way there's sufficient time for those of you who would like to ask questions. And those of you, you have additional things to do. Some of you might decide to go to your studies or other matters. And because as we see this is being recorded, it affords an opportunity for people whom none of us will ever meet. Those people will have an opportunity to join this conversation and may, take, may actually contribute to it in ways we cannot imagine. Now, earlier today, I had the good fortune of going over to the Albert Schweitzer Center. And I would like to say thank you, not only to the organizers, but also to Sternut and also to this university for the very idea of having lectures like this. And part of this is that these lectures understand that philosophy is also public. Now, there are people who are against the idea of philosophy being public. Some people look at philosophy as a professional technical exercise, and they could, they could do that, but once you take accountability seriously, there has to be an understanding of philosophy that can speak to you, to you, to you, to you, and the camera to you. So, the first thing is when I went over to the Albert Schweitzer Center, uh, I had some fun because we walked around, there was a piano in there. And I play a variety of instruments, so I went to play the piano. And this is connected to an experience that's very similar. I've had this many times. It's actually, although it's great to play a highly tuned piano, uh, it's rather interesting sometimes when you go and there's a piano and there are witnesses, there are the listeners here who had heard me playing the piano over there. Uh, but this also happened when I lectured in South Africa. I gave a talk in South Africa where I went up to the piano and my guest said, it's not tuned. And I said, no problem. So I sat down and I played, I had a good time. And the piano I was playing today was also not tuned. But when I finished, my hosts went over and said, we thought it wasn't tuned. And, right, one of my colleagues here, am I, am I lying? Was it an untuned piano? It was a very untuned piano. Did it sound untuned? It sounded untuned. It sounded, right, there were other listeners. And here's the mistake people make, you see? If you really, if your concern is to make music, really make music, then you pay attention to a simple fact. Just because something is out of tune doesn't mean it cannot make music. You just simply have to play it in a different way. 
And some of us forget that. In fact, we bring that rigid mentality to music, also to society. We think if certain people are out of tune, <laughs> they can't make music in our society. And the music, of course, is living together, justice, all these things we think about. But if we stay clinging to the idea that people have to be tuned, we try to force them into the, in the keys rather than to create keys that enable them to flourish. And so that's the first thing to remember. Being out of tune doesn't mean you don't belong and you can't make music. Now the second thing is, some of the things I talk about may seem a little technical, so I'll give a, I just wanna give a little musical exercise so we could be together, we could be as if we're on one page. Now, I said piano, but this one is drums, okay? So, I, some of you may have seen me do this in various um, settings, but let's just go to it. Okay, you got that? Now, what did I just do? Well, I just did two bars of seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, the first thing to bear in mind is that there are many ways to count seven. Seven, after all, could be four and three. Seven could be five and two. And seven could be one and six. Now, although I tapped each time the same way, didn't each of them sound different? And this is something crucial to bear in mind. Because you see, if I had started off by asking you, will they sound different? You go into a silo and try to say, well, I'm gonna be different. But if you then are asked afterward, there are people who may tell you that you're all so radically separate in your silos that you cannot share and understand something as a community. Yet what I just did was something collectively we heard. And that tells you something, because we're part of the same species and communicative practices that enable us to hear beats and music. But what I just did was more than that. Because you see, if you study logic or you know, other areas of philosophy, I also showed what a musical bar is. And a musical bar revealed what's called a well-formed formula or full sentence. And in addition to that, what I just demonstrated is that a condition of possibility of us being able to hear this is us sharing a world. There's communicability. And so although many of you are from different backgrounds, different languages, we connect through the very fact of learning languages to communicate other languages. And that is called a transcendental argument. But it also reveals something significant because it means philosophy can be communicated not simply through words, but can be communicated rhythmically. Now, of course, you can do seven in many ways, right? The way I just did it was, you know, but of course you could do seven this way. That's seven. In fact, you could go to others, six. That's six, right? But we live in a world in which people impose upon us the notion that somehow real music, doing it properly, instead of the way humanity wants grooved, move, say, no, 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 be rational. Man, can you imagine, or at best, a waltz. Now, humanity used to know how to party. We even get fancy, right? 
and suddenly you're being told to do Well, in a way, that's also a story. That's a story of colonialism. Because colonialism tries to tell all humanity we should be squeezed into a little box. And somehow, if we have some life, some rhythm, some passion, somehow we're not being rational. But even there, it gets weird. That's a very narrow view of rationality and reason, for instance. All right? There are people, for instance, who think you should contain yourself to be rational. In fact, one model of it is that to be rational, you must be consistent, all right? Which means whatever you say here must be consistent with what's said here and here and here. So logically speaking, if you go on infinitely, you can be maximally consistent. Sounds really great, right? Maximally consistent. However, I ask you, all of you in this room, would any of you love one day to be married to a maximally consistent person? <laughs> really think about it. <laughs> I mean, you, you already know, that would be hell. Because of course, rationality is a part of us, but, but in fact, you know, part of being, if, if you are with someone who's maximally consistent as the order of rationality, at one point where you're in the inevitable argument, the inevitable moment of dispute, you're gonna to say to that person, you are so rational that you are unreasonable. Isn't that something? That reasonability and rationality are not identical. And this is crucial because you see, reasonability requires taking responsibility also for rationality, which means that it's connected to other ways of relating to the world. For instance, to be rational is to know how to follow a rule, but to be reasonable is to know when it's appropriate to break them. And that is part of what it is to be a human being. So that's to introduce some understanding of the way I'll talk about music that would require thinking of it in an open way. So now I go straight directly to black. Among the things that many of us don't think about is we use the word black, and I was having a wonderful conversation. You know, I'm also Jewish, and one of the things I notice about when people talk about Jews is they always think the Jews they know are the Jews. <laughs> ah, laughter of recognition. <laughs> But it's the same thing with black. Everybody thinks their blacks are the blacks. And they don't realize that the people they're referring to tend to be a matter of location. So for instance, the United States is right now hegemonic. It's a powerful country. Before, when people talked about blacks, they talked about the UK, Britain, they don't, right? the British Empire. For that, they talk a lot about it with uh, the, the, the French, the Spanish, the Dutch etc. empires. And the same thing with Jews. You could follow the history of how people think of Jews according to who was the latest empire. When it was Spanish empire, Sephardic Jews ruled. That was how people thought of Jews. When you think of caliphates, the Arabic world, Arab Jews ruled. And it goes on and on and on and on. Right now, a lot of people think about Jews as understood in the United States. Well, the thing about blacks, the first thing to remember is that there was no reason, absolutely no reason for the ancient people of Africa, or many people in different periods in Africa, to have thought of themselves as black. They thought of themselves as Wolof, Yoruba, right? Oza, Kokoyo, Luo, etc. Similarly, there was no reason for most people of Europe to think of what became Europe, that is, to think of themselves as white. There were Celtics, Vandals, varieties of other groups. And not only that, Concepts like white and black had different meaning. So for instance, it's hard for many people today to understand that there are places where, for instance, black is just such a cool, wonderful thing, especially when it is so hot that the sun will burn the crap out of you, so you look forward to the night. And within those frameworks, that is very different. There are also other ways of thinking of black, the way people think of it in Australia, New Zealand, 
When they think of the Kori people, here you know them as aboriginals, the Maori people, etc. However, the black that most of us are talking about is the black that was created from Euro-modern colonialism, enslavement, and the degradation of humankind made global. Okay, that's what many people think about. And within that framework, they think of black in such a way that they almost, they, they fail to understand when they think about black, they fail to understand that this was being done to people, to people. And that means people have points of view. So the first black I'm gonna talk about, the first black to, to just summarize, is the black is understood from the people who impose black on them. And that's often a negative black. But there's another black. There's the black that comes from the lived reality of people who affirm their dignity in the world. And that black, we could call that with a capital B, that black tends to connect people with thinking about black in creative ways. To understand this distinction, try to, if you look at a lot of the ways people talk about black people, it's premised on the idea that black people must just be imitations or echoes of white people. And a lot of people don't realize that fallacy. I'll give you an example. A lot of times these days, people love to say the word black Jesus. And it's really funny, because when I write, I always say white Jesus. Because there's no way anybody historically was in that part of the world was white. Okay? And so the real, you know, so white Jesus is the fiction. And so, we know, but within that framework, the presumption that black must be imitation leads to certain fallacies. So for instance, if black people don't fit certain beliefs, certain scientific presumptions, certain expectations of the world, the response is, what is wrong with those people? And W.B. Du Bois, the African-American philosopher, sociologist, political economist, the list is long. He basically says that this comes from a mistake of making people into problems instead of looking at the problems they face. If you look at the problems people face, then you understand that they're human beings facing problems, and you could understand how human beings respond to being put in those situations. And so when we begin to understand black that way, we begin to think differently about how we can think about music. Because you see, if you're completely closed off, if you're completely just an object for people's degradation, there's no room for you to assert your humanity. And many people, when they look at these issues, they tend to collapse them only into moralistic concerns. And that hides a very basic fact. For instance, when people are resisting oppression, they often speak about the revolution. You're gonna change the world. You're gonna make things different. But the problem is, they often try to outline a world that's supposed to save people, but if you analyze it and look at it carefully, it's a desire to create a world in which people cannot actually live. I don't know, would you all like to live in a world in which you don't have art on the wall, paintings, music, where you eat, oh God forbid, purely bland food, right? A world in which you cannot have pleasure, joy. And this becomes crucial because you see, if we go and look at enslaved people, and not all black people were enslaved, but if we just look at enslaved people, enslaved people, and really try to imagine this, the rations for many enslaved people per year was a bag of cornmeal, some animal fat, some salt, and maybe some pieces of fish. Nobody could live off that. So the people had to find a way to find food on their own. 
And in the midst of that, as they work together to do this, they begin to develop ways of thinking about the world. And as they do this, they begin to do something that at first we don't realize is ultimately revolutionary. And what that is, is that they begin to develop a way to be with each other. That in a world that say they're nothing, that they're crap, that they have no value, none whatsoever, they begin to defy all that by having an understanding of themselves as deserving pleasure, joy, celebrations. And among those many ways is music. So many of you know the spirituals, but if one talks about spirituals purely in the, the old way, I teach a course on global existentialism, for instance, and a lot of people don't know that a lot of existentialism also came out of religious thought. But it was from people being very critical of the way people looked at worship. Some of you who are religious, could you imagine you go to a church, or you go, you know, or if you went to a synagogue or a mosque and the attitude, but let's pick a church since a lot of people are from that background, and you go in and say, you know what those things are like. Oh, dear Lord, amen. Goes on and on and on. And when you think about it, this, they're talking about God. I mean, God. Think about how awesome God would be. I mean, must be if you believe there's a God. And you're going to show up to the most awesome thing in the universe. And, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? And so if you're going to do it differently, you're going to have to have what Kierkegaard calls fear and trembling. Or you could do what John, bless you, or what you know, Dan Aykroyd wrote in the Blues Brothers, where they have the church scene, it goes in, the light hits them, and they can dance. You're moved. And so in the spirituals was also something beginning that was very profound. They were sung, they were in groups, but they also created meaning. And this is crucial because if you can bring meaning to the world, then you are an expression of freedom. Okay? And then out of that, we know, came the blues. And many, many of you, you know, what's interesting about this is, you see, again, we don't want to fall in the trap. You see, the trap is to treat something like the blues as if it was, it, it, it was exclusively just coming out of one place, like one thing, one way. However, the blues, there are many explanations. One version of the blues is a lot of you don't know this, but particularly in the Anglo world, a lot of the people who are, who are white, who are directly in touch with the people who are enslaved, were Irish or Scottish or Welsh. And I bring this up because, as you know, in the blues, the blues are also people come from Africa with music from Senegal, from music from you know, parts of Ghana, from, different, from Nigeria, etc. But why did I bring up these Irish, Welsh, and so forth? Well, you see, the Irish had a concept called the Blue Devils. All right? Now, I know some of you are not over 21, but I have a strange feeling a lot of you are familiar with what happens if you drink too much alcohol. Because that waking up that next morning is to wake up to God's flashlight. <laughs> right? And that's the Blue Devils. You know, it's like, <laughs> right? But there's another blues that was also from the African continent. Blue indigo, blue things. There were moods, celebrations, but there were also special rituals associated with blue. So blue in the blues began to emerge. And what's amazing about the blues is you all know this. Everywhere on the planet today, there's somebody listening to the blues. There are people in Beijing sitting down, yo man, I got to listen to the blues. There are people in Argentina listening to the blues. There are people in Mongolia. There are people in Stockholm, in Sweden. Everywhere there are people listening to the blues. And why? Well, you see, this is one of the extraordinary things. Because despite all of these efforts to degrade these people who became black people, you see, these people lived in a world where they would communicate with other people and humanity began to create something 
that challenge that world of degradation. And that, in doing so, there's a technical term. The blues became the leitmotif of what we call the Euro-modern world. Yeah, there, although there are all kinds of musics you could play, every kind of popular music in the world today has some connection to the blues. Even country western, you know? Someone is twanging away, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my horse, my dog, my cat, my whatever. And they, and they have their Confederate flag, and they, yeah, oh yeah, I hate black people. But they're playing black music. <laughs> there are people, punk rock skinheads, oh, yeah, I don't love my rock and roll, my rock and roll, ah. They're playing black music. Now, there are some interesting things about black music. There are technical things I could say about it. But just to give you a sense, if, I'm just going to explain a 12-bar blues, OK? 12-bar blues, you make a statement. Then you repeat the statement. Then next time you say it, you move to up what's called a dominant fourth, four notes up. And then you go back to the statement, but then you make a shift into a dominant, and then you're back. Now what's interesting is if you made a statement the first time, why repeat it? Well, the repeated moment Although it's the same words, it's different. It's almost as if to say, had you heard me, it comes back in, but because it refers, it gives you what's called apperception, self-reflection, connection. You see? And then when you put a twist on it, it's often done with a slight dissonance, right? So there's a tension. And then when it comes back, there's another thing where it seems lost and that it's resolved. Now, why do I, why, what is this, even though that's a structure, if you listen to certain blues, and there are many blues musicians, it'll take too much time to get into them, but one of, among the people I love was to listen to Dinah Washington. You can listen to Bessie Smith, you can listen to all kinds of people sing the blues. Then there's some people, you don't sing the blues too well. But Dinah Washington has a great, great song, Crazy Top Blues. Now listen to these lyrics. I got drunk last night, and I took my man to his wife's front door. Yes, I got juiced last night. I took my man to his wife's front door, OK? So that's, that's the second like part. She repeated it. I'm just hurrying it along. But then the next part. But she was a 45-packing mama, so I ain't going to do that no more. <laughs> now, if you look at the structure of this, it's really profound. Because she says something that's clearly inappropriate, right? And she repeats it in case you think, did she really say that? But then she puts a twist that shows the implications of this, and then she takes responsibility for her action. And this is the part that's profound. I remember years ago when I was writing, I, was writing, I wrote a, in the 90s an essay called Frederick Douglass as an Existentialist. And there, there was a real schmuck who said, oh, what's the point of talking about existentialism and enslaved people if they're not legally free? You know, they have no conception of freedom or existence. I'm like, yo, if you're enslaved, you're thinking about freedom a lot. <laughs> and what this person, so, you know, so this thinking about freedom, but here's the thing that's about freedom, and this is the thing about freedom. You know, people love to talk about freedom in this country. Love to talk about freedom. While developing rigorous ways of increasing enslavement. It just is, that's the history of this country. Right? Freedom is great, uh, but man, we want to profit from enslavement. But at the same time, a lot of people are afraid of freedom. And again, there's not enough time to elaborate it, but the short version, the short version of freedom is that if you're free, if you're really free, then you're also responsible for your actions. 
And it's really powerful that people, even in a situation of the whip, the chain, the brutality, being told their property, their things, they still understood the complexity of responsibility for their freedom. And so in that music, it leads to jazz. And in jazz, jazz is a music of freedom. How do we know jazz is a music of freedom? Well, for one thing, I played all over the world, and I could meet jazz musicians, and we don't have to say anything. We don't even have to play. I could just simply say, let's play. And so I go, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, let's do it. And jazz musicians join me, and they perform. And that's because we communicate, we listen to, we play with each other. Now this has profound philosophical implications. First of all, with jazz, you don't have to have what you're going to perform spelled out ahead of time. It is while performing, the composition is done. And that challenges certain models of how we think about mind. But additionally, in jazz, what comes together are several crucial elements raised in what is called black thought. So I'm going to just say them and conclude because I want to hear from you. The first one is pretty straightforward. If you're going to enslave people, dominate them, and tell them they're nothing, if you're going to tell people they're property, you, you force them to ask the question, what am I? And in that question, that raises what's called the philosophical anthropological question of what is a human being. Could you imagine if, if you all walked in and somebody walked in and said, hey, all of you in this room, you're not human beings. And if, you know, at that moment, you're like, what do you mean I'm not a human being? Now, if you were to say to someone who did that, I'm as human as you are, you would have lost the argument because you would have made the person who challenged your humanity the standard of being human. So suppose you say, and, and do you want to make a person who is racist, homophobic, sexist, um, you know, anti-Semitic, uh, full of Islamophobia, all kinds of racism, misogyny, do you want that to be the standard? So you say, I'm not going to make that the standard. I'm going to be the standard. But at the same point, what gives you the right to be the standard? Have you worked out your psychoanalytical issues? So at that point, you begin to realize that maybe the standards need to be in interrogated. And that's the philosophical anthropological question. The second one is easy. If you have a world of enslavement, then of course you're going to meditate on freedom. Freedom becomes crucial. And then the third one is tricky, because in the third one, you are going to question the way people question the way we question things. In other words, one of the challenges raised by enslavement, colonization, and all those categories is a crisis of justification. And so if even justification is challenged about whether it's justified, then the issue at hand becomes how do we connect these things together? And so when we come to the music, we move very quickly then into other kinds of music. Because you see, in jazz is freedom, but also other things came out of jazz. Because you know, jazz has all kinds of things going on, but you know, in jazz you also lead to R and B. So you get right? And then before you know it, you got Marvin Gaye, and you got soul, Otis Redding, you got Aretha Franklin. You got soul music going on. And after a while, people, got to, people begin to learn things, like people begin to learn in the rest of the world that, hey, they got hips. <laughs> All right? People begin to learn about the funk. This funk. You ever wonder where funk is from? I mean, a lot of people don't realize, when you say you're the funk, you know what funk really means is to stink. But at the same time, so how do you make it funky? Well, you ever look at it, you ever seen people dance funky? 
especially when people can't dance, but they want to dance funky, they always do something with their lip. <laughs> but if you look at the anatomy, it's like they're trying to s squeeze one out. <laughs> they're going to make it funky. Right? And then, but, but, but there, you know, but then from there, you begin to realize, wait a minute, that's crude, that's rude, but hey, maybe, you know when I gave that example of maximal consistency, that was like about purity, and that human beings are not purities? Well, you see, here is one of the things about the black, uh, uh, that's, it's not exclusively black, because indigenous America raised this issue too. What all this is about is realizing that the truth of our society is that every society has dirty laundry. Every society has the funk. And we should all, if we want to deal with reality and truth, not simply deal with our niceties, oh, I like the air, but we also need to deal with our funk. And within that framework, there are people who take other ways to do it. Now, why did I also tap comes to hip hop? Because you see, hip hop began to challenge the very notion of music and a musical instrument. In fact, the very fact that this podium is not just a podium, but can be made into an instrument, tells you that it has multiple meanings. And part of human freedom is the ability to bring meaning to the world. In hip hop, people began to bring new meaning to everything from a record, to a sound, even to what it is to sing. You, have, have you all ever heard Biz Marquis, You Got What I Need? You know what I'm talking about. Now, of course, the brother can sing, but that's what makes it sound great. You know, I mean, he sits there and he goes, and thank goodness, I'm a terrible singer, so it works. You got what I need, but you say he's just a friend, and you say he's just a friend, and he goes, oh baby, you got what I need, right? And it makes it work because it makes you think that music doesn't have to be the way people have forced music on you. Now, this is not to romanticize all of this. We don't have time to get into it, but there are, all, there are also elements that will seduce, that are not interested in dignity, freedom, not interested in the critical or artistic sense of black music. There are people who want black music only to be entertainment. And this is where that requires a longer discussion because at the heart of it is the distinction between playing with, laughing with, performing with, and laughing at, playing at, making fun of. And the long complicated thing is that however a form of freedom is asserted in black music, there's always been an effort to domesticate it, to turn it into minstrelsy, to reassert the notion that something is somehow authentically black when it erases its humanity. But we don't have to leave ourselves locked at that. We can take very seriously at least some of the messages that offers for us to understand the society we live in, and what these things mean. So if we go, and I'm going to conclude with the jazz allegory. Because you see, what if, just what if, our society was like a jazz performance? And what I mean by that is, if you look at a jazz performance, when a jazz musician plays, her job or his job, when another musician is playing, someone takes the lead, so there's a point where you're playing, and a soloist comes up, but it's not a soloist in a technical sense because that person is taking the lead. So it's that person doing, doing, the, doing the work. The job of every other musician is to drive that musician 
to do her or his best performance. And then when he or she finishes the sax solo, the trumpeter, everybody tries to make the trumpeter do her or his best performance. And then you get to the drum, the drum solo, same thing. In other words, a society committed to making the music work. And this is a dangerous moment in our society because there are people of resentment who don't want our society ultimately to work, to groove, so to speak, because it's become like the band shows up but there's an obnoxious drummer who just keeps soloing no matter who's playing. Or you know, the person who, you know, I remember I played with a band once where there's a guy who always, always, no matter what you do, had to hit the last note. Do you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes at the end, we're doing and then we're at the end, we're like, ah, and we're supposed to all go, ah, and he goes, ah. <laughs> we, we got to give him a name, you know. I won't say his name, but let's, let's say his name is John, because that's just generic. We could say, last note, John, you know? And that's what malignant narcissism is about. However, these other examples where you make yourself accountable, where you understand that you are actually working to each together to make music is an expression of non-narcissistic love. Narcissistic love says, I love you because you're like me. That's narcissistic love. But non-narcissistic love loves you in a way to build your potential and your capacity to grow. And if you think about it, that point I made about ancestors and descendants, they're not here, they're anonymous. So if we act from the expression of non-narcissistic love, of radical freedom, radical love, and what it is to build societies that groove, then one of the messages, one, not the only, but one of the messages from black music is to build through that love its reach to the anonymous to live their own lives. And the message that we hope at best we can get from them is that when they look back at what we do, they think and they simply say, thank God they acted. Thank you. Yes, please say your name. Uh, Joe Hello. How are you? Um, can you connect, or can you connect the, uh, the literature of the Bible Renaissance to the Okay, so the question is, can I connect the literature of the Harlem Renaissance to black music? Okay? Okay, that's the first question. Next. Uh, where? Okay, good. Hi, there, Professor Jonathan Richter again. Um, Hello. Using the framework you sort of laid out throughout your um, presentation, how would you unpack the, um, the artist in the 1930s, I believe, uh, Al Jolson, if you're familiar with him? How would you unpack someone that um, was, a, I, would, I would say, is talented, of course, with, with his singing and his, and his, uh, and his uh, performing, but, uh, of course, him using blackface is sort of problematic and, of course, uh, in today's time and then, of course, um, in the past when we look back. Okay. So the question's about Al Jolson and blackface. Okay. More? By the way, don't get, don't get like all nervous. There are people, there are people who are so, so freaked out about certain issues. But remember I said, we deal with the funk too. And it's, I think it's healthier if people can deal with uncomfortable issues, okay? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry? Oh, yeah. Okay, go ahead, and then we'll be over here. Yeah, question. Hi, Professor. Hello. My name's Ethan. Thank you so much for coming to speak. Uh, my question is about uh, jazz as a form of rebellion. Do you think that in the way that jazz, especially in time structure and structure itself, it is very different, it involves a lot of improvisation, and things like that. Do you think it's a form of rebellion against Western styles of music that were imposed on black artists? Okay, and we have over here. Yeah, I got a question, sort of, uh, reflection of the Al Jolson question, that is the fake musician who plays in whiteface. 
And this is a this is a personal question. So as a person who fell in love with music, grew up in the fifties. Grew up in the 50s and 60s as my hairline like yours reflects um, some long time ago. A fellow who fell in love with this music and really learned it from the people I call, at least in my life, the first cultural appropriators. So I learned probably every note of guitar that I in my early life from a guy named Eric Clapton. And at the time had no idea where the music came from. And of course, eventually found my way back and then became embarrassed about playing it. And so how does a guy who plays in whiteface address the depth, the context, the history. But I have, I have no right to stand in the shoes of the people who have become my musical heroes, the Robert Johnsons, the, the Gary Davises, blindly, uh, blindly, uh, all those guys. Okay. Yes. I think it's for the uh, video camera. Okay. So there's been a lot of talk lately about cultural appropriation, and and I too listen to and read about and discuss with people music, and it feels as if there's a shift. It, depending on who you read and who you listen to, the fact that. In America, which is, rumor has it, a melting pot, um, these musics were going to come together anyways, because we always were listing. Stephen Foster was listening to the slaves, and it's monetary appropriation, I think, more than cultural appropriation. How do you feel about that? Okay. Well, what I'm going to do is start, oh, there's one more. Uh, what the reason I, I, I'm going to start after, after you, Joanne, is because one time I did it, it just kept going, but the audience forgot what the other questions were. <laughs> so Joanne, and then I'll start speaking. And I know her name, Joanne, because she's one of the honor students who came for lunch earlier. Okay, so my question was, in your opinion, in what ways has, like, like the, we know about like the mass imprisonment of like black people that's been happening for years. How do you think that like black music specifically, like hip hop and rap has changed with it or how has that specifically impacted that kind of music? Okay. Well, I'll, thank you. Thank you for those, these questions. They're wonderful questions. They enable us to get into other dimensions of the talk. Clearly my talk was to outline a set of, a set of problematics. Uh, the thing about the Harlem Renaissance, there were many writers, but a particular one to pay attention to is Alan Locke. And Alan Locke wrote um, The New Negro. He wrote a variety of other essays. And the Harlem Renaissance was working not only at the level of music, but the level of sculpting, the level of visual arts, etc. But Alan Locke had a very interesting argument. It can be summarized by a simple phrase, which is, human beings cannot live in valueless worlds. And I think that's a really beautiful analysis. Someone could give you all the material comforts, but if they took out value, right? The, the things that make life worth living, everything from the food you eat to the, to, you know, the, the, the art you may have. There's a reason why the first thing you do when you move into a house or an apartment is decorate. You're transforming a place into, I mean, a space into a place. And so what the Harlem Renaissance realized was that although people treat it, often treat culture and the question of aesthetic production as a side issue, like you have the main stuff and now you're adding the garnish, that is false. Because we know if you took, that, took those dimensions out of the lives of people, you can have a world in which people have a lot of material needs met, but they commit suicide because life ceases to be worth living. And this is an insight that was in the Harlem Renaissance as well. There were also those who were, today's language, black bouge, uh, people who want to show white people that we are as civilized as they, as good as they, look what we could create. But that's why I made that argument that if you try to present yourself as justified through imitation, you would have lost, okay? And so the question of uh, Al Jolson, that's, um, I'm writing a book called Fear of Black Consciousness, it comes out comes out next year, and I have, a, I have sections where I talk about this issue, but there's another book in which my wife, Jane Gordon, and I 
It's called of divine warning, reading disaster in the modern age, where we also talk about that. Uh, the, the thing about blackface that's complicated is, before we get to Jolson, is the, um, the need, remember, you know that point where I talked about humor, when I talk about the distinction of laughing with versus laughing at? There was a real need to believe that black people are so non-human that we lack the capacity to understand our, our condition, okay? It used to be, there was a time when many whites would say, if I were black, I would kill myself. Now really think of the logical implications of that. If it's true that to be black is to find your existence so abhorrent that you would kill yourself, then it leads to the, the next logical question. Why don't a lot of black people kill themselves, right? And it was a long time, it was believed that black people were endemically incapable of suicide. To the point where Alvin Poussant and Amy Alexander did a book called African American Suicide. <laughs> and there are all kinds of issues around this, but what it comes down to is the presumption that even to think about understanding, right, the black condition is something black people are incapable of. of. So you have to place that condition through putting into the black externality a white consciousness. You see the logic? And in that white consciousness, there became then blacks who would put on black face. But, they, but what they would perform as supposedly black was a stereotype. Because it was a projection of what a world an anti-black racist society needed to believe black people were like. You see what I'm getting at? So the performance is not only for black people, it's to enable people who hate black people to exhale. So that's the first logic, in, and that's why people love to see whites who perform blackness. And it gets very tricky. There's a, a, a brilliant movie on this issue is of obviously Get Out, but there are lots of others, right? But, but here's where it gets tricky. Because you see, black consciousness is okay as long as it's a conscious that's not politically aware. So let's just imagine, and this relates to some of the other questions, right? So in other words, if a person put on black face, but then started to speak like Malcolm X and actually give a whole critique of the society and its injustices, uh, they, they're gonna, well, we know what happens to white people who join black struggles and are socially manifested as a political critique of the society. A lot of them also got lynched along with blacks. It happened in South Africa. It happened in this country. And so they, the reason minstrelsy can work is to lock black people at the level of affect and entertainment. But the deeper question, all right, of a black political consciousness, say, in a white body, would have the same problem, all right? Now, it's not to say that they are the same existential condition, because there are other factors in how a white person lives in the world, okay? But, and then it makes it more complicated because Al Jolson was Jewish. And this is even more complicated because you see, what many of you don't know is the history of Jews in Europe. Today, people are rewriting Jewish history to meet their ideological needs. But Jews in Europe were not white people. And in fact, there's a complex It'll take a long time to explain this, but an effort to make Jews palatable in the United States required separating Jews from um, um, the history of Jews. A lot of you don't know the concept race emerged to describe Afro-Muslims and Jews. So in an effort to separate Jews from race, the question of religion came in, and in a country that says you have religious freedom, then you could say, look, I have my religion, 
But now the question is, okay, if your religion is Judaism, what is your race? And in a country that says you could only be a full citizen if your race is white, it led to a complicated history of how to make European Jews, because there were a lot of Jews in this country who were also not European. A lot of people don't know about everything from East Indian Jews to African Jews. A lot of people, a lot of people don't know a lot about Jews. Kaifeng Jews. I, I created centers to study Jews. And I work with Jewish communities all over the world. There's so many kinds of Jews. And that's why I open up with saying people think their Jews are the Jews. But somehow, a small set became the representative of the rest, and they became white Jews. But you see, to become white in America is a complicated phenomenon. Not just with Jews, with Greeks, with Italians, with Irish. If you look at all the Europeans who became, they, they initially were not white. But if you look at their histories, and I'll give you an example. I gave a talk at the Hellenic Museum in Chicago. And at the talk, it shows the history of how Greek Americans became white. The Ku Klux Klan used to lynch them, go after them. And believe it or not, it was Greek women who had set up a meeting in Colorado with the Ku Klux Klan. And in that meeting, they said, what can we do to be acceptable to you people? And they said, you got to be Christian, and you got to be white. And, they, and it was like, well, how do we become white? Well, very simple. Hate on the blacks. <laughs> and so uh, Greek civic organizations emerged that on the surface looked like it was to celebrate Greek cultural pride but they were actually white assimilating organizations because Greeks before actually connected more black communities and became a form of a conflict. And a lot of groups become white through conflicts with black communities. And so if you're going to put then in the midst of that moment in history, the deeper subtext of Al Jolson putting on blackface was not simply, because remember, it has to be a white. So it's not so much Right? That simply he had the black face. But in the film moment, it signified a subtext of becoming white. You see? And so within that framework, this gets to the other complicated issue. Because you see, um, jazz musicians, if we, we have to get out of the idea of black aesthetic production as reactive. It was not necessary. Sometimes it is. Some artists deliberately will take on certain Western forms. But generally speaking, no. Louis, from Louis Armstrong all the way through, even to Art Tatum, uh, even if you go through the complex issues Monk was doing, it wasn't to take on white people or any of that. It was to radicalize our understanding of music. You know, when I was playing earlier, for instance, I played a song I wrote for Thelodious Monk that used a lot of dissonance. And it challenges what we think music is. In other words, they were artists. And in some forms, they may use European forms, and others they didn't. Now, I'm going to put for, uh, in a lot of my writings, I am adamantly against the cultural appropriation argument. It's, it's become, and there are many reasons. There are a lot of things I have unconventional views on. And here's the reason I have a problem. The first problem is that when something is properly cultural, properly cultural, right, it is communicable. And what is communicable? There are so many things that many of you have in this room right now that you think is white or Western that are not. And that's because they work so well with the way you live that you're able to make them, you could bring them into the orbit of your life. Uh, when I, in Jewish studies, for instance, I show a lot of things that people think today are Jewish that were not historically Jewish. But it's not that they're not Jewish now, it's just that Jews brought Jewish meaning to it. You see? Now, why do I bring that up? When we think about, for instance, rock and roll, there are a lot of rock and roll artists who are trying to play the blues. If you look at Led Zeppelin, they, they thought they were playing the blues, but they brought their stuff to it and it became their kind of music. But to bring it home, there was one day I was, I was in, actually was in New Haven. I went to get gas. This was when I was a graduate student. 
and I'm, I'm going to pump gas, and in the background I heard, boom, pop, and, and, you know, and you know, you're pumping the gas. And I'm like, damn, that beat's good. So I'm like pumping the gas, you know, I'm getting into it, going. I'm like, man, I should have asked that person who it is. So I turned around, and there was this white guy, right? And people would want to call that cultural appropriation, but it's insulting to the music to do this, and here's why. Perhaps he was listening to the music because the music was good. You notice that with all of this obsession with cultural appropriation, people are forgetting to listen to the music. Salsa is amazing. Reggae is amazing. You don't have to, those people in China who listen to the blues don't have to be thinking of their history of being enslaved and on plantations, etc., to know the beauty of the music. They may not understand it in the same way, but if you think about it, today, for instance, you can't think of being Irish without potatoes, although potatoes were from Peru. What are Italians without pasta, but that's from China? T tomatoes from the New World, corn. We can go out with foods, all these things that people treasure as part of their identity, may have it from elsewhere, but if something is useful in the human world, human beings will use it. And so if we come to this question, the problem is, there, there, there are longer reasons why people get into these debates, but the problem is people are confusing the concept of appropriation with the other issue of historical misrepresentation, amnesia, and exploitation. For instance, there are a lot of things that many of you now know as white that were historically black. When I teach my classes, I explain, if you took black people out of history, what your day would be like. You wouldn't be able to turn on your, your, your light bulb because the filament was invented by a black person. The doorknob, black person, so you're stuck in your room. And then, uh, and then you know, you, you have to deal with other things. The porch. Porch, porches weren't developed by Europeans. Enslaved people brought porch to the world because African structured homes were such that they were designed so you could look at the children, but if you're outside looking at the children, the sun is down on you. So you had to put a shade and you create porches. Porches were brought here by that. Soap, oh man, how about brakes? Oh, you wouldn't be able to drive your car here, you'd be in trouble. You start going to the music you're listening to. We just showed that the music that dominates most of the world, whether it's the tiny country western all the way to the rock and roll to whatever else, that is from black. Now, of course, the point isn't to valorize black people. It's just saying those are contributions because there are many groups. Right now, I don't know what many people would do in this country without sushi or what a lot of people would do without, oh God, what would happen to suburbs without yoga? You're right? I mean, and so, but, but the point is when people participate in it, they bring their stuff to it. The real issue is not to erase the history, it's to make the connections. You see? I want to have a world of people, if you look at jazz musicians, for instance, jazz musicians were breaking segregation ahead of a lot of other people. Why? Because they loved the music and wanted to play together. Benny Goodman may, may you know, he made sure he had other people such as uh, Lionel Hampton playing with him and it's not that he's a more noble or better human being than others, it's he loved the music. And so there are many ways in which the participation in the, in the stuff that make our heart move, the stuff that brings our passion, that, that is the thing to focus on. And so I would rather hear that people listen to hip hop because they love the music. There are some people, because I don't think most whites who listen to hip hop want to be black. Uh, there's a whole other issue about the commercialization of hip hop. Today, it's to primarily in its money to white audiences. It's not that black people stop listening to hip hop. It's just that the, 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 the world of music has changed in such a way that economic forces may dominate. And similarly, in this country, a lot of people don't go to hear jazz, but in Europe, jazz sells out a stadium. And so, but the main thing, when we think about cultural production, artistic production, whatever it may be, or even when I think about the way I do philosophy, I don't do philosophy simply saying, 
Only one group of people did philosophy and nobody else thinks. I look wherever people think the ideas and I participate in them. That's why when I teach, for instance, this semester I'm teaching ideas that in, include people, in addition to people like Simone de Beauvoir, Simone Weil, uh, a woman by the name of Nathalie Etoke. I'm also teaching people like Surya Aurobindo, Ali, Ali Shariati, you know, Nishitani, many others, because you see there are elements that when people participate in common problems, you know that point I made about students? That each of you, as you learn the problems, you may have different things you can bring to it that you can communicate with others at how to address the problems differently. And so if we come to that understanding then, one of the things in putting at the forefront, freedom and humanity as a statement in black music, that is the reason it speaks to the globe. It's not that black music must be intrinsically better because there are some crappy black music out there. There really are. Every kind of music form is just like European classical music, you know, there's some things that are just crap. But there's some things that are so absolutely beautiful. And not just beauty, there are some things or so, they just speak to us with their cleverness, their joy, their aspirations, that we connect to it and subsequent generations listen to it. And as that is there, not just with music, but I think it's an allegory for also the academy, for ideas, for society, that if we get rid of this mine versus yours mentality and think, what, and think about what we actually are, which is a species dealing with us, then we can actually get rid of a lot of crap and actually start learning more from each other. And I'm talking about black music, but as we know, we could start getting into many other forms of music. I go, uh, just, to, just to give you an idea, just to, this is, and I'll stop with it, this will bug you out, but straightforward. If you go to Jamaica and you ask most Jamaicans, where is the source of the reggae beat? They will say, Africa, my brother, right? It's from Africa. The reggae beat's not from Africa. Jamaicans made it a Jamaican beat. However, when I went to Chandigarh, when I went, because I go all over Africa, and I'm like, I'm not finding any reggae beat, except for Africans who are saying they're playing reggae. You see what I mean? So where did this beat come from? And as I'm walking around, I ended up in Punjab. And when I was in Punjab, I discovered the reggae beat. The beat is from Punjab. And it's a Punjabi beat. And how do you know? Well, if, here's how it sounds if you're in Chandigarh or some other area of Punjab. Right? Now slow it up. That's the reggae beat. Dancehall does a different kind. It does another Punjabi beat. That's the dancehall, right? But here's the point. It doesn't make it less black or less reggae. Because what they brought to it is the part that communicates it across the globe. And that's something that we should keep in mind when we think about it, deal with the injustice of the misrepresentation of culture, but encourage the co-participation in what human beings share. Thank you. <laughs>